like when we talk about food security, we're talking about yep. <coughs> producing and all of the challenges of producing, and then you've got the transportation, and then you've got the accessibility, um, all of those things that relate to um, people and communities not having sufficient amount of appropriate food, nutritious, appropriate, culturally appropriate food, is is what I think what I think of uh, the work that we're doing. Mike Wood, Crossroads Valley Farm, poultry producer here in Anaganish. Just living out in the Ohio. How do you be here? <laughs> it really comes down to that relationship with your food, relationship with your farmer, relationship with your community, building community back. I think it all starts at the kitchen table. I mean, if referencing the local economy, yes. I mean, and especially because I know that Nova Scotia, at least in recent years, has been the province that has the highest poverty rates. Um, so because of that, I mean, that's there's sort of a direct correlation to poor eating. So I, because they can't afford you know, to feed themselves properly and get proper nutrition, etc. So I think that if there was a larger focus on local eating, and if that was and that larger focus resulted in providing to those individuals more. One, it would sustain the individuals that currently can't. But I also think that, yes, focusing on um, the local economy, whether it be Nova Scotia or Canada, and focusing on those providers rather than um, exports from Mexico, etc., um, it definitely improves the Canadian economy on the whole, plus Nova Scotia as well. So I'm Karen McKinnon. I work as a dietitian and really I think the goal of the Anaganish Food Security Association is to do ad community advocacy, education, and program development where possible around issues related to food security such as poverty. Anaganish is the highest rate of food bank use in the province and we're the second highest province in the country next to Nunavut yeah, for in terms of food, food insecurity. So it's a, it's a huge issue and uh, I think that speaks a lot. I think people would be very, very shocked to find out what some people are living on in, in our community. So the Student Food Resource Centre is basically, it operates similar to any food bank. So we operate on the basis of um, largely donations and then the rest of the food is funded through the Students' Union. When, when I started here, like in my first year, we had roughly about 100 students that utilized the resource. And last year, I think at the end of the year, we had um, close to 400. Close to 46% of university students face some sort of food insecurity, so that's either not having access to food at all or not having access to like health, healthy alternatives. Of 
course, like food banks are considered a, almost like a band-aid solution because food insecurity is kind of one of those signals to an, a deeper underlying problem and that's people are not financially able to um, buy their own food. What needs to happen is people need to have the income in order to be able to purchase food. Um, you know, like we can only, really we need to get at the root cause here and so there needs to be a lot of work done around that issue because I think we keep trying to do all these initiatives but it's not solving it so at the root cause of, of a lot of people's food insecurities that they don't have the income to buy food. So we're a small dairy farm here, we milk about 25 cows. It's just the two of us here, my partner and I, and we do everything from raising the calves to making our own hay and silage, and you know, it's a very, very fulfilling and rewarding, but also busy, busy job. For us, our number one priority is a happy and healthy cow because a cow that lives longer is going to produce more milk and ultimately you're, you're raising fewer replacement animals. Um, so the industry average is around six years old that a cow lives to. Whereas to me, that's a cow that's still just getting going. Well, we're a pasture poultry producer. We produce eggs and pastured eggs, pastured chickens, and pastured turkeys. I'm more into regenerative farming. Uh, sustainability is kind of status quo, and I want to do better than that. Uh, but for me, it means about local, and it means about uh, using the right inputs, uh, the right methods of farming, ethical, ethical means of farming. So it's a combination of things, but it's basically just getting, kind of getting back to real food. Um, in terms of uh, the, the racialization in the food system, like who, who is producing the food that we're able to access cheaply from, from global markets. Um, in our own country, um, farms here in, in Canada, but also uh, farms in, in other places around the world. There's so many policies that exist that stop Indigenous folks from accessing their traditional and, and current food ways, and, and that it's not only about what you can buy at the grocery store and have access to there, but what are we doing to our waterways and our land that, and land in terms of ownership to, to stop Indigenous folks from living in the way that, that makes most sense for them. My name is Doreen Bernard. Um, I'm from Sibinegri. I'm a grassroots grandmother, a water protector, water walker. The, the Sibinegri River is, a, is a main, our main highway, it has been for, for the Mi'kmaq people here, living here, um, for over 13,000 years. This river is very significant to us as uh, we've been living on the river before we were pushed back to the reservation where we are right now. So we settled on a river this, in Shubenagri. And um, this river is our life source. It's not, it's not a resource, you know, it's our life source. Um, so many of our people continue to fish all the different species of fish here in, um, along these rivers here. And what I see the rivers as is the lifeblood of Mother Earth, as the veins of Mother Earth. And this, this river connects to all the, the groundwater and the, uh, the drinking water for, you know, people that live in this ocean all around here. So it's very significant.
we already notice a big change in our summers. Um, when I first moved here, it would be super wet, and you know you only had a certain a certain window to do your cropping. And now we find it's will have extreme extreme drought. So it's it's very difficult to know like what to plant, and it's it's harder for our animals as well when you're having a, a hotter climate. Um, so I think for us, you know, it, it really makes us question what we plant, where we plant, and how we graze our animals and things like that. So it's definitely a concern because you do notice a difference a difference in the growing growing season for sure. Um, so food is a commodity that's bought and sold on the international markets which has extreme major effects at local uh, levels. So, I mean, I grew up eating carrots and turnips and squash all winter, and that's the sort of diet that we have, but now there's an expectation that you have your fresh tomato and lettuce. Mm -hmm. So that's going to base, most of that is going to come from outside. We When you go to the grocery store and you're finding products that are being shipped in and you think, well, wh why do we need to have California strawberries right now when Nova Scotia strawberries are in season and they have both of them? So. I'm actually an engineer by trade. I've done this uh, line of work for my family for good food. I didn't grow up on a farm whatsoever and, uh, until I fell in love with a dairy farmer and fell in love with the cows. So about six years ago, I decided to quit my full-time job and farm full-time. Yeah, just like people who are like together, like united with something that like makes sense. You know, I've done I've done a lot of not a lot because I can't handle it, but like jobs just like for the sake of like making money or something. And like I can't do it. Like I don't feel like doing it. The only motivation is is if the only motivation is like making money, it just feels feels bad, right? <laughs>